so much, Dr. Teresa. Thank you. And uh, Sister Sarah, thank you so much for such a, a very, you know, insightful entry prayer. Once again, I welcome every one of us. It's a privilege to be sharing with you here today again. I'm not here because I know better than you, not at all. The reason why I'm speaking is not because I am holier than any of us or I'm a better revival instrument, no, but I have a mandate from God to bring this platform. And like I'm gonna share for just about 45 minutes thereafter, we will go into sharing or question and answer. So it will be opportunity for you to say something in line with what we are discussing. So like uh, Dr. Teresa said, we have been on the subject of understanding what makes prayer effective. Because for revival to be, for revival to continue, for revival to be enforced, for revival to be accelerated in any generation, there must be a praying people. There must be a praying people. Prayer without revival, I mean, revi uh, to think of revival without praying, you know, is, is, is just like a mirage. You'll be talking about it, but you will never get to it. You will see it in the vision, but it will never be actualized. So prayer is the key that unlock heaven, which we've understood from several scriptures. So how do we pray and pray aright? How do we pray and ensure that heaven's attention will be arrested and the forces of heaven and the earth will be mobilized to bring answer to our prayer? How can that be? So we have looked at the first key there, consecration, as Dr. Teresa just, you know, highlighted the teaching of uh, last week, which I personally also want to join everyone to listen to it again and again. There are messages I listen to. I listen to it. I can't even count the number of times I still go back to it because the more you listen, the more you get depths of insight and clarity, even deeper than the person that did the teaching. All right, today, the Lord told me, I want you to speak to my servants, speak to my children on a subject that is not meant for the weak-minded. It's not meant for the shallow-minded. It's not meant for babies. It's meant for the matured. It's meant for those who have counted the costs of revival. It's meant for those who are ready to pay the price of revival. It's meant for those who are ready to see God heartbeat come to reality and remember his heartbeat which we are discussing to cast fire upon the whole earth and that is revival fire remember his heartbeat it is that all men might be saved all men might be saved that is god's heartbeat how can this be now i want to share with us on the second key that will make our prayer effective, that make God, if God is busy doing something, he will drop it to attend to you and to respond to it. What could that be? Today, we want to look at the subject of the will of God, the will of God. What does that mean? The will of God speaks about the plan of God, the eternal plan of God the long-term plan of God. The outstanding will of God speaks about the intentions of God, the purposes of God, the interest of God. It speaks about the, the view of God, the view of God, God's view concerning the matter. Most times, as you will discover in our discussion today, most of the prayers believers pray are actually their own view, is actually their own mind, their own plan, their own desire. But when you want to pray and have God commit to that prayer, have God commit his full you know, integrity, his full integrity, 
his full authority into that prayer, then you must consider the issue of the will of God. The will of God speaks of God's vision concerning the matter, God's intentions, and God's mind concerning the issue. You know, it, it, it dazes my mind when I look at the scripture that says that as the heaven is, is higher than the earth, so are the thoughts of God and the will of God higher than our ways. The will of God, the thoughts of God, the ways of God are higher than our thoughts, our ways, and our will as the heaven is higher than the earth. Think about that. Some of the things we desire are actually not God's will. <laughs> Some of the things we crave for are not what God is looking for. Some of the things that appeal to us, they don't appeal to God. Some of the things we want to see is not what God wants to see. The will of God. The will of God, like I said, speaks of the agenda of God. The agenda of God. It speaks of the pers God's pers pers perspective, God's perspective concerning the issue. So when you want to pray for the will of God concerning the nation of Iran or Iraq, Afghanistan, the nation of America, the nation of Nigeria or South Africa or the UK, you need to ask yourself, what is God's perspective over the issue at stake? All right, having said that, I want us to look into some scriptures and it is this, the scripture will explain itself. The scriptures contain the counsel of God. The scriptures contain the voice of God. It concerns the integrity and the authority and the perspective of God to everything. That's why it is written for our admonition, our instruction, our correction, and our guidance. Now, Let's begin with the very place where the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6 from verse 9, and Jesus began this way. He says, in this manner, pray. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. In verse 10, he says, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from, from, from the evil one. You, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's Matthew chapter 6 from verse 9 to verse 13. But my interest is in verse 10. It says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth. Now, Jesus, from the very beginning, tried to get the church to understand that prayer is not about what you want. Prayer is not about what you feel, how you feel. No, prayer is not to be detected by the circumstances and what the people are saying, what the people want, but what God wants. What God wants, you will agree with me that the first time Israel shot their, themselves on their foot was when they began to ask for a king as other nations have. They were asking God to give them a king because they want to be like other nations. And that was not the will of God for them. Well, they praised and they praised and they praised until God told us, um, what's the name of Samuel? He says, fine, let them have what they want. And that is what we call the permissive will of God. The permissive will of God. People can pressure God in some circumstances, in some situation. God will allow them to have what they want. And shortly after that, it will come to their you know, senses that, wow, we have, we have destroyed ourselves. It is better to go the way of God's will. It's better to follow the pathway of God. So the will of God is the way God will follow in any given circumstance, in any given issue. The opinion of God, the mind of God, the plan of God, the perspective of God in any given matter. All right. Now, Jesus told them from the very beginning that as you pray, 
Pray that the kingdom of God will be done, will come, and that the will of God be done in our lives, in our homes, in our businesses, in our institutions, in our nations, as it is done in heaven. Now, another place that Jesus portrayed the need or the importance of we being in the will of God in our prayer is in the book of Luke chapter 22 from verse 41 to 43. And I read, it says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it is, if it is your will, if it is your will, Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. This, this is quite interesting to me as a person, that Jesus, from the very beginning, even before he left heaven, he knew what he was coming for. Before he left heaven, he knew what he was coming for. He wasn't coming to do miracles. He wasn't coming to preach, you know, the, just to preach the gospel. No, he wasn't coming for the wonders he did. No, he came primarily, he came primarily to go to the cross and to pay the price for the redemption of humanity. That was the original mandate for which he came to go to the cross and to die in order to go to the grave and to take the key of death and to arise and return back to glory. So there's no way his mission on earth would have been fulfilled without him having to drink that cup. But when the point of the action came, when it was time for him to step into the real thing, the mandate, the mission, the original blueprint for which he came, when the very hour came, what happened? The humanity in him arose. The natural, he was 100% God, he was 100% man, not 50-50. Now, when that hour came, the burden was too heavy, and he prayed that prayer. He said, Father, if it be your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So men of God, women of God, as you listen, I want you to please understand that is to pray and God answers. In other words, to gain God's attention in your prayer, to gain God's you know, authority, integrity, aligned with your prayer you need to understand the issue of God's will over what you are praying. What is God saying? What is God's program? What is God trying to do with this situation? You know, I think I've said it here before. One friend of mine, I, okay, I was in a meeting and a friend of mine was sharing. He said, you know, African people, when they face challenges, they start binding the devil, casting out the devil. They will command fire to come down and melt down that mountain at that challenge. That is how you know them. They will vibrate in prayer. And, but when the same challenge faces the white people, they will first of all ask God, what, is, what are you saying over this matter? What is your mind? What is your will? Is this case I am faced with meant to teach me a lesson? Is there something I need to learn from it? Is there something you are communicating to me? God, what do you want me to do about it? Do I move it or do I learn from it? And things like that. So we laughed over it, but it passed a message to me. And that is really true. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, when I face a challenge, that was then. When I face any challenge, the first thing is to respond. I command you, get out of my way. I command you, mountain, be moved. I command you, disappear from my presence. But, you know, and sometimes you pray and pray and pray. It, the mountain is still there. The situation is still looking at you. 
you know, and you go back to fasting and binding and losing it, and the thing is still there looking at you. Sometimes the challenges we fight against, some of them are actually orchestrated by God to pass a message. Some of them are packaged by God to mature us, to equip us, to, to enlarge our capacity and to make us better vessels for God's use. All right, you may not agree with that, but you will get to know it with time. But the point is, certain mountains people face are schools God sent them to. They are schools God passed them through in order to mature them for greater mountains and things like that. You know that when, uh, what's his name now, David, when David was confronted with the lion and the bear in the, in, the, in, the, in the bush where he was taking care of his sheep. He must have prayed, God, why did you allow this? Why did I have to go through this? But what did God do? God gave him the strength, the ability, the skill to kill the lion, or I mean, to snatch the sheep from the mouth of the lion and the bear at different times. And I'm sure there must have been scratches and wounds all over the place. He must have cried, God, you shouldn't have allowed this. But God allowed it to equip him, to prepare him for Goliath. So when Goliath came, he looked at him and laughed and said, if God could snatch, help me to overcome the lion, overcome the bear, definitely this Goliath is not, is not an issue. God who saved me will also save me in this matter. You know, now, that's not our discussion for today. Now, the point is, Jesus said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, not as I feel, not as I want, not as I'm pressured to want to have it. Let your will be done. So we are talking about agents of revival. We are talking about praying the will of God, praying the power of God into, into motion, unleashing the fullness of God's power, unleashing the fullness of God's power, God's potency, God's wholeness into a city, into a nation. It has to be not as the president will, not as the political party will, not as our local denominations will, not as you will, but as God wills. And some of the will of God, beloved, are not easy for human mind to accept. Now, look at this Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. It said, therefore, do not be unwise. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. The same Ephesians chapter 7, verse 15 from the New Living Translation, he says, don't Act thoughtlessly. Don't act thoughtlessly. But understand what the laws, what the Lord wants you to do. Don't act thoughtlessly. King James says, don't do, said, do not be unwise. Do not be unwise. Don't act thoughtlessly. Rather, understand what the Lord wants you to do understand what the will of God is. So when we want to pray, first of all, it's important to understand the mind of God, to understand the mind of God, because sometimes some of the things we were, our natural life, our, our, our natural response is to command this thing to get out of the way. Sometimes God wanted to stay. God wanted to stay to help you understand certain things you do not have any clue about. Certain challenges actually help us to come nearer to God. Certain challenges which we do not want to see at all around us. Some of them are, like I said earlier, students are at schools God sent to us to, to educate us to know what we did never knew and to know what we will never have known. He says, do not act unwisely, thoughtlessly, but in all things, try to understand what the will of God is. So 
first step to praying down heaven on earth is to know the will of God, the mind of God. And we have some of the studies about the revivers of old. You will understand that some of those men and women God used in those days were men that were dead to their own will. They were dead to their own flesh. They were alive in the will of God, in the will of God. In the will of God. Several years ago, a friend of mine in Kaduna, where I used to be, was doing a, a you know, writing a, a what do you call it, a newsletter, a monthly newspaper, and I don't ever forget the title. He says, "Preparing my will for His will, preparing my will for His will." Sometimes you need to take time to 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 talk yourself into shifting from your will and cleave into his will. You need to work on yourself because on daily basis, on weekly basis, monthly, yearly basis, we are confronted with things that actually mess up our own pro program, our own will, our own intention and plans. So Paul said, the thing that we are of gain to me, I had to lay them aside that I might embrace the things that are of gain to God. The things that we are of gain to him, he said, the things that we have gain to him, he count them as rubbish for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Simply put, that he might do that we please God. So Christian work is not about pleasing yourself, it's about pleasing God who died, who sent his son to die for you, that you will no longer live according to your own will, according to your own pleasure, but according to the pleasure of the one who died for you and gave up his all for you. Now, I want us to look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, he said, First John 5 verse 14, he said, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Wow, that's quite exciting. He says, this is the confidence we have. This is the confidence. This is the assurance. This is the boldness we have that we, sorry, that we have in him, that if we ask anything, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. He hears us. So God, it tells us that God can do anything. God can do anything. He said, if we ask anything, anything, anything according to his will, he hears us. So what it means is that we limit ourselves, we limit the possibilities of God, we limit the abilities, the possibilities of God, the capacity of God. We limit him so much when we pray based on our own thought, based on our own feeling, based on our own will, our own plan, our own intention, our own perspective to the issue. We limit God. But when we pray according to God's will, then we unleash the full capacity, the full potential, the full power, the fullness of God will be unleashed and engaged into the situation. So seeking the will of God is therefore very necessary if we must have the fullness of God in the land of the living. If we must, if God must rend the heavens and come down and shake the nations and shake the mountains and shake the valley and shake the sea and cause the desire of nations to come and cause the nations to begin to gravitate towards him, then we need to understand the will of God in every matter we are confronted with. I want us to look at John, James chapter 4, verse 3. I'm just reading the scriptures. Because the scriptures explains perfectly what God is saying here. James chapter 4 verse 3 says, You ask and you do not receive <laughs> because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. On your pleasures. On your pleasures. Is God against we having pleasure? No. No. But there are your pleasures and what pleasure God wants for you. The, the cravings of the flesh, 
The cravings of the flesh is different from the pleasure God has ordained for you. Now look at it from the New Living Translation. It says, and even when you ask, you don't get it because, you don't get it because, thank you, Lord Jesus. He said, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives, your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure, your motives. Now, human beings, human, and we have to be honest with ourselves in this matter. We humans, sometimes we, are, we, we, we compel God in prayer. We try to pressure God in prayer to do things we want as a result of wrong motives, wrong motives. Sometimes I go to prayer meeting and I keep quiet, or I'm leading prayer and I raise prayer and I keep quiet at times to listen. And when you listen to the prayers of some believers, sometimes, including me, including me, sometimes I'm praying according to my own motive, according to my own passion, according to my own feeling. It do happen to every one of us. And some of those prayers we pray, is just we just pray it to, to feel good, to have this relief. Yes, I have poured out my feeling to God. You just to pour out your feeling, to express your feeling. It's fine. It can give you some emotional and psychological relief. But if it's to get God to step in and to do what he wants to do, you need to understand his mind about that matter. So, revival prayers are based on the will of God and not the motive, not the human feeling, not the human you know, desire and drive and pressures. The will of God, the will of God. So, we also see in line with that, in John chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus said, and can, he said, you can ask for anything in my name and it will be done, it will be done and I will do it and I will do it so that the father, so, sorry, sorry, let me read it again. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the son can bring glory to the father, so that the son can bring glory to the father, so that the father be glorified in the son. Now, that brings me to the issue of praying in the name of Jesus. You know, somebody may say, but I prayed that prayer in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? Somebody can place a curse on God and put the name of Jesus. Somebody can place a curse on people and put the name of Jesus. You can just say what you want, what you want, which is to keep. Sometimes what we want is actually against us without we know it. That's why the Bible says, oftentimes we do not really know what we ought to pray. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit to help us to pray in, in words that, that only God understands. Because when we pray the Holy Spirit, this is part one of this discussion. I'm going to come into part two of it. Now, in the part two of it, I'm going to discuss some very mind-boggling you know, issues. And I want to encourage you, please don't miss the, the, the second edition of praying according to the will of God. There are some deep issues God wants us to discover as we look into that next week. Right. Now, I need you to understand this matter. That praying and appending the name of Jesus to it does not mean you are praying according to the will of God. Like I said, you can be cursing yourself and without knowing, you can be asking for something that is to destroy you in the future without you having any clue about it. Be it in marriage, be it in the choice of business, be it in, in, in the city you want to go to or what you want to do with the money you have, how you want to spend the money, you know, who to marry, you know, what, which of the jobs to take up, which business to do, which city to relocate to, you know, and things like that. Major issues. Should I leave this job for the next? 
Should I stay? Should I leave? What do I do over this man? Every one of us face it. Everyone face those moments where you actually don't know precisely what to do. And at that time, the voice of the enemy comes. The voice of the flesh comes. The voice of friends comes. The voice of relations comes. Circumstances, past history comes knocking and speaking loud into your ear. At that moment, you need the voice of God. The counsel of God, the Bible says, the multitude of counselors that is safety. Now that that is that comes that that is the counsel of men. That is the counsel of God. You seek the counsel of men when it's becoming difficult to understand the counsel of God. The counsel of God is the will of God, the mind of God. What God is saying over the matter. I am aware that something, even myself, certain things I face is like God. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? So I need us to understand that praying is great, wonderful, but it's important to pray. It's better to pray for 10 minutes according to God's will than to pray for 10 hours against the will of God. Because after that 10 hours, if God choose to have mercy on you, he will bring you back to what he wants you to do, which when you realize it, you may what took you 10 hours could have taken just 10 minutes. So knowing the will of God is important because knowing the will of God will make the journey easier and make the journey safer for you. Like I said, it is not to just say, Lord, I want this. I want you to do this. I want you to do that in Jesus' name. Sometimes we even shout it as if the louder you shout in Jesus' name, then the more it becomes the will of God. As if the longer you drag that name in Jesus' name, then it will God will be God will be forced to 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 include or to enclose your prayer into His will. No, the will of God is the plan of God. The plan of God was drawn without you before you were born. The plan of God has been drawn. God does not do do emergency plan. No, before you were born. Certain things have been decided. So you need even cry Jesus when he came. He said, I have found that which is written concerning me. For I have come to do your will, your will, your will, O oh Lord. So he told them when you want to pray, discover the will of God and pray according to the will of God. When we pray according to the will of God, he answered us. He answered us. Outside of the will of God, we are praying amiss. And we can labor, we can fast, mobilize the whole nation, gather in the stadium. We are praying, we are shedding tears, but praying contrary to what God wants. So first of all, what is God saying over the matter? And it is very humbling to realize that you may be praying contrary to God's will. And you have to humble yourself, accept it, admit it, and change your prayer. Finally, on this matter, I want to read 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. It says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, he said, whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? How? Because we keep his commandments. We keep his commandments. I want to rephrase it to, to this. We receive whatever we ask because what we are asking for is in keeping, is in keeping with his commands. It's in line with his commands. When we pray and we ask according to the commands of God, the commands of God, God answers. According to the will of God, God answers. So having said that, I want to encourage every one of us to begin to consider the things we pray. Are they according to God's will? The things we, are even, we, we prayed this morning, yesterday, are they in the will of God? Like I said, it can humble you to realize that what you are pushing, you are craving, you are calling through the day and through the night, fasting, you've even given offerings and sacrifices, you've sown seeds to get God to hear you 
and to do what he wants you to do. Take for instance, when I left, when I was in the university, I went through some very challenging experience. I was the student pastor and I would be walking on the streets of the school, going to the lecture and the voice would be speaking to me. I want you to serve me. I want you to serve me as a missionary. Sometime I'll be walking on the road. I will be talking, sinonoquizing, talking to myself. I say, God, please not me. Please not me. Find someone else. I don't want to be a pastor. I want to be a businessman. I want to do this and do that. I had a diary where I listed so many things I wanted to do. I said, pastoral work, not me. Missionary work, not me. So this journey went on for years until I left school and uh, I started a business in the city of Portacot in Nigeria, you know, and uh, each time I went out with, uh, with my business partner, as we were driving along, I kept hearing this voice, this is not for you. This is not my will for you. This is not what I want you to do. So my friend would be driving, but he didn't know what I was going through. This battle was going on. I would be talking. Sometime I take up fasting and I will go to a solitary place calling on God, Lord, I want to make money. Leave me out of this gospel matter. I don't want it, please. I went, it went on for a long time until one day we went for a conference and Renard Bonke was, came to Portaco to do a crusade. So he was running minister's conference. So I was in that minister's conference. I had just left the university then. And then I was in that meeting. The man, it was time for him to lay hand on people. So he came with two other ministers and then they were laying hand. It happened that I was on the line that, you know, led to his own, you know, um, where he was standing, laying hand on people. When it got to me, my turn, the moment he touched my head, I had a voice that said, go sit somewhere, I want to speak to you. So I went and sat, sat down in that hall. And the, God said to me, I want you to embark on a 30 days fast from this place. I was to go for a wedding from that meeting. So I went to that wedding, a friend of mine was wedding and uh, I, was, I didn't eat and I began the fast. I didn't know what I was heading into. So as I began to pray, that voice began to come up. It began to come up. I want, it is the will of, it is my will that you serve me as a full-time missionary. That is my will for you. I began to fight it. I fought it with all my life, honestly. I said, God, please. And I mean, I don't want to do that. So 30 days I was begging God, he didn't shift. I said, God, I will not stop this fast until you agree with me to let me do what I want to do. So I went on until day number 42 of that fast. I went for a meeting, a night vigil, and a man, a man of God was speaking, Reverend Isa Ebuba. Isa Ebuba was ministering in that meeting. And while he was ministering, I don't know what came on me. I saw myself step out of my wheel, out of my box, and embrace his wheel with pleasure, with excitement. Something happened inside of me, and that was it. I said, God, whatever you want me to do, I am ready to do that. I am ready with excitement. I am ready to embrace your wheel. And right there, he said to me, now you have accepted to do my will, I shall give you a new name. You shall be called Light. That was how my name became Light. You shall be called Light, for I will send you as Light to the nations of the world. That was how it began. So I went to the General Overseer of our ministry, uh, Daddy Cosma Silechuku. I said, Daddy, please. I want to do the will of God because that man of God had told me earlier, he saw me, he listened to my teaching somewhere and he said, Pastor, uh, uh, the, my name, original name my parents gave me was Simon. He said, Simon, I heard you preach somewhere and if you could have this depth of understanding, then 
you should take up a responsibility to serve God full time. I says, daddy, please, not me. I am not interested in that. I want to do business and live in the city of Port Harcourt and that's it. So, and uh, I approached him, I said, daddy, this is my dealing with God or God dealing with me rather. And uh, I want to do his will. I want to serve him. And he said, you are welcome home. And that's the beginning of my missionary work. So I want you to please understand, sometimes what we want is not what God wants. Sometimes what we are praying for is not what God wants. You know, even when it comes to our children, sometimes the life we want or the career or whatever we want our children to embark upon really may not be the will of God for them. So that is why neither sometimes the, what they also want to do is not the will of God for them. So um, a child may wake up and say, dad, you know, this is what I want to be. And uh, I tell parents, you don't just have to say amen. You need to prove God, is it what you want your, my child to do? Is it what you created him for? Because God will require us to get our children to know the way they ought to go. The way they ought to go is not only the way they should dress, it's not only the way they should relate with people, but what they should do in their lifetime. We should help them to discover it. It's not their choice, neither is it our choice. It is the choice of God, which we need to help them to discover God's choice, God's will, God's plan and purpose for them and help them to embrace it in good faith and with confidence that God who has made this choice for them is able to make them a living testimony in the land of the living and to have fulfillment beyond any earthly measure. So I, go, I guess I'm going to pause here so that people can ask questions and make inputs and make comments. So having said this all, I want to conclude by saying that the will of God is not a threat to our pleasure in life because it looks like this matter of God's will Am I sure it will not put me to trouble? Am I sure it will not make me to, to, to lose the, the future I desire to have? The wisdom of God, the Bible said the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. I interpret it to mean that if you could gather all the wisdom of men together, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of all men put together. And so is the weakness of God, stronger than all the might, all the strength and power of men all put together. So please, like Jesus will say, not as I will, but let your will be done. Not as I want, but Lord, let what you want prevail in this matter. Are you facing a challenge in a relationship? Are you facing a challenge in appointing someone to take a particular position in the church, in your workplace, in your business, in your office, in the school, in the government? Is there any position you are confused or you know who should be there? And your human nature is telling you that guy has been nice, he's been good. He has been favoring you. He respects you the more. Why do he's related to you? It's your relation. The father did ABC for you. Why don't you, you know, appreciate the father by giving the son a position in, my, in that company or in the government or here or there? Please, if you want God's full will, uh, I mean, God's full force, God's full blessing, God's full interest to be engaged in any given thing, Seek the will of God. And if the will of God rubbishes your own will, if the will of God counsels at your own will, trust God. Trust God that his judgment is wiser than your judgment. His wisdom is greater than your wisdom. God sees the future. You don't see the future. You don't know the future. You can have a little glimpse of the future. You see just in part. The Bible said we see in part, we prophesy in part, we know in part, we understand in part. But God is here that has the full picture of the future that awaits us. So let us trust him. His will is the best for us. When we walk in his will, we have security 
safety. We have reassurance. We have divine shielding, divine protection. Whatever comes the way of any man or any woman that is in the will of God is not coming to that person. It's coming directly to God. In other words, when you throw an arrow, to anyone who is in the will of God, that arrow is not coming to that person. That person, that arrow is coming straight to God and you know what will happen to that arrow. So when you are in the will of God, you are in an enclosure with God. You have been, you have been encapsulated inside of God. You are in God's divine shield and protection. Put it differently, God will only protect you when you are standing in the place of his will. If you are outside of God's will, you expose yourself to arrows of the enemy, to danger, to disaster, and to destructions. Sometimes people do the will of God and it's like things are not, life is not as pleasurable as they would have loved it. And the enemy begin to make them to wonder. You see, you say you are doing the will of God. See where you are. Some people have married according to God's will and they didn't have the child. I mean, there are a number of stories like that. Some people have are gone to places they, they, they didn't want to go, but they knew that this is what God wanted me to do. And it's like, they could have flourished better if they were in a different place. Now, those are some of the things we are going to look into in our next meeting. How do I know when I am in the will of God? How do I know what the will of God is in a given matter? How do I know? And how do I walk while in the will of God? How do I make the most of the will of God? Because you can be in the will of God and you, you fail while in the will of God. Can that be possible? Yes, I will explain in our next meeting. So I want you to get yourself ready for our next discussion on this matter. This is a very serious discussion and I'm sure God is very interested in it because it is the center of our activity as children of God. Walking in the will of God, accomplishing the will of God, choosing the will of God, that's where the beginning point because when you choose the will of the devil, you know where you will end up. So the choosing the will of God, walking in the will of God, you know, and uh, executing the will of God. These are different things. So we shall see how it goes and God will help us. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Father, I give you thanks for this brief word that has come to us this morning. We give you praise. We give you thanks. Father, I pray that this teaching will trigger a hunger for your will, that this teaching will inspire us to, to think less of ourselves, think less of people, but think more of you, that we might see what you are seeing and understand what you will have us to understand about the given situation that is the prayer point. Have mercy on us and help us to see your will, to embrace your will, to stay in your will, and to walk out your will for a generation. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, I will stop here at this moment. Please ask your questions, make your input, and uh, let's take it from there. God bless you. Thank you so much. The moderator, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Apostle, uh, once again, for that very, very powerful and insightful teaching. I do hope we are taking notes of our own.